Okay. Yeah, we're ready to throw down. What a voice. Yeah, like it. Told him, I told him in the... Uh, okay, I'm giving you a countdown. Five, four, three, two. Hello, Maurice Swainsmith here with Nuclear Popcorn. We're back with the incredible Laureen Landon. She was here. Thank and, you. you know, she's so nice, I had to bring her back twice. Just like NYNY. Thank you for coming back. Thanks for having me. And we also have now the uh, great jazz singer, Gina Venturini. She's also a fantastic poet. We're going to talk about her work. Thank you, Gina. Thank you very much for having me. And Miss Leah Bergman, she was here previously, and she's my guest host again. She's quite incredible. And she's also an artist, also an actress. In fact, everyone here has something that's kind of closely uh, entwined, and that's why they're here on the same stage at the same time. So we'll start with my great co-host here, Leah Bergman. Thank you for coming back. You did such a great job the last time. <laughs> Thank you, Dwayne. It's always a pleasure to be here with you. Thank yeah, you for having yeah, me. Yeah. And you're a great journalist, but mm -hmm. you've done acting as well. Could, could you tell us what's going on with you right now? Well, right now I've taken a little hi hiatus because I'm writing a novel. Um, oh. It's a, uh, yes, and, and I don't know if how much I should give away, but because it's you, Dwayne, I'll tell you a little bit. What I want to do is, is and this has been ruminating in my mind for a long time, as, as you know that a lot of writing does, and I want to bring together how supportive and loving women friendships can be, and it's, it's fiction, but that's, that's the main focus and theme of it, because I think too much what happens is that as women, we compete against each other. We bring each other down, and I want this to show, because, because that's the type of female relationships I've had in my life with my friends, where it's very supportive and loving, where we help each other grow. Very and true. so that's what I'm working on right now, and I'm not sure when that will be done, because it's, it's fiction, and, and that takes some time to develop. So, mm -hmm. um, But in the meantime, I am still um, doing my journalist uh, writing and, yeah. and a whole bunch of other things. So yeah. thank you for having me. Thank you for coming back. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Is this fictional uh, work going to be somewhat sci-fi or love story, or what's it going to be about? Well, it's it is it's about I think it's about women's journeys and the things we go to, the ups and downs of our relationships. And I, I really started it as a love story, but as I started writing it, it it came together with different women's stories and how they go up and down, but they're always there loving each other. Very cool. Yeah. So now that's a good segue into your friend here who's rubbing elbows with you, also an artist, <laughs> also a writer. Well, thank you, Maurice, Gina for having me. Gina Venturini, thank you so much. Well, I say this, there is no, um, there's no coincidence of why people are brought together. And just hearing the, the story and the inspiration behind your book is now I know why I'm here on this panel with you here today. Why is that? Uh, well, because, you know, I've written three books of mm -hmm. poetry inspired by the awakening of my heart. However, I'm trying to write the fourth book, and it's the idea that's been coming to me as well is about women, because I too mm -hmm. have this tribe of women that have gotten me through so much in my life. Mm -hmm. and. My inspiration, I also want to go into public speaking to help, you know, to talk to women's groups, to help them overcome things that we all women go through, whether it be, you know, divorce, you know, losses in our lives. You know, let's face it, women, we are very powerful creatures, and at times we forget that because we allow ourselves to be so vulnerable to other resources that might cross our paths. Uh, so that's what I've been, you know, it's been going over in my mind and I'm trying to figure out a way to actually create something that can create a platform mm -hmm. that s speaks strongly about women. And because I, I do, I see it on Facebook where women are arguing with one another and I'm just like, why would you do that? So is your book, is it, is it going to be a similar platform as Color of My Heart? Is it going to be poetry? Or what? What is it? What? How are you writing? That's it? what I'm trying to figure out. Cause mm -hmm. I, I'm, I figure, I, I feel that my forte is mostly poetry. I do mm -hmm. write different types of uh, inspirational poetry based on either love, based on transitioning of life. But that too, I would like to, you know, maybe more p put it in more of a, a novel sense that a publisher might be more interested mm -hmm. because poetry, uh, in my experience, it's it's really hard to sell 
to a big time publisher. Mm. Well, can I say something? When I was, when I first spoke to you, you spoke of a, of a haunting, well, it seemed like a haunting type of memory of a person that was true love type of thing, touched your heart. And I was like, well, are you still in, because when I read that, I was like, well, are you still in love with this guy? Because it's, you're written in such a way that it's, I don't think many people would be able to just unlock their heart and their true feelings. It seems like your feeling is coming right out of those words straight up to somebody. And it's like, the first thing I thought, this is very vulnerable, but it's strong to be that, to be able to let someone see inside of your soul like that. Just read, read some and then they'll, they'll see what I'm talking about. You want me to read it? Or? Sure, if you want, go ahead. You pick, pick one each. How about the art of relationship? Okay. I kind of leaps out at you and tugs your heart. The art of relationship. In the art of relationship, there are people who will raise your ego and people who will elevate your soul. The ego can only exist for so long. Recognize the difference. Yeah. Go a little deeper, right? Just right in the middle. Well, why don't we let her choose it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just I had I had them open. I just want people to okay. to, to see the tender, tender, yeah. tender. I'll read this poem called some The Because some is pain, it looks like, and some is love and pain together. Am well, I right? Well, you know what I can do is I can read the last. I'll read the. Um, so this book is hearts don't bend, they break. Mm -hmm. I'll read the last poem where called Where the Greatest Lessons Live, okay? okay. Um, knowing the pain that I had gone through prior to meeting you and that you could never love me in return, most days I ask God why he would let our introduction take place. And when I reflect on my journey before you and where I am today, my heart reiterates her need for her true voice. She shows me every word you inspired me to write. And although the lesson of you was painful to learn, I only have myself to forgive. And now I know it's in the unknown where the greatest lessons live. Mm. Mm. Deep, right? Yeah. Oh, Very yeah, sad. Yeah. So it seems like there's pain, but there's love. It's, it's, yeah. It's, I mean, from coming from the, from a, I wouldn't say urban, but from, well, black people, we have a term for that. Like when, when, it's like if, if you're like taking a test and like instead of doing the test, you hand in an empty sheet. <laughs> you're like, man, what's going on? I'm thinking about this girl, man. We call that a ten, uh, either a love hangover or um, <laughs> but, but there, was, there was a term we had in, in high school. I and there was a song about it. Hangover. Yeah, but it's yeah. just like when something just takes over, you just can't shake it. Yeah. I wouldn't say a, a mojo or something like that, but. <laughs> well, it's, I, I look at it this way, people, are brought into our lives for a reason, right? Uh, this was a brief, you know, affair, but it it had wakened my heart from the pain that I had gone through from my marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what inspired me to, to write. And as I say, people are brought into our lives for a season, a reason they're not necessarily meant to stay. Love Jones. Yeah. That, that's the word I was looking so for. So I I look at it as this person was brought into my life to to one, help reawaken my heart, and two, to, you know, move me forward into something that was meant for me to be. Mm -hmm. I've always tried writing before. I used to write, you know, blogs, um, and I am a singer-songwriter, so the music, you know, does flow into the poetry as well. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, I'm that type of heart that it takes a profound energy to break through my wall, but once that does, I fall head over heels immediately. Mm -hmm. I know it's something that I have to work on. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, but it's also a very good thing too because when I was reading it, it's like, I mean, guys don't like to express themselves like that sometimes unless it's a song or something. Then you can hide behind the notes and try to play it off. But people, even guys would uh, identify with that because, I mean, everyone's been in a love relationship and I'm sure five, ten years later, you're still thinking about somebody like you're still thinking about that person, but you just don't tell nobody, and you're like, it's gushing out like like blood, you know? It's like your heart's <laughs> pumping in that. But, and, but now, are these different? Well, well, is it just me assuming that you're writing about this person, or just love in general? Or A little bit of both. I mean, certain poems were about, you know, specifically based on my feelings for this person, mm -hmm. but then other poems are based on you know, just love and life itself, also mm -hmm. transitioning, mm -hmm. you know, out of baby heartbreak into love. Cool. So what's the message, the general message that you would like to bring to your readers? Uh, the, the, I, 
I say the, the message I would like to bring my readers is you have to keep your heart open at all times uh, because when the heart is open, things attract to you at a you know at no notice, and it's gonna it can you know elevate you up to something that's that's moving you forward into your greater purpose because mm -hmm. we all have a great purpose here, mm -hmm. right? You know, my, my dream was to be a, a famous singer. I chased that musical dream my entire life. And then that brief meeting turned me into a writer and today I get more respect as a writer. Mm -hmm. And it's brought me more things than my music ever did. Now mm -hmm. since you're talking about music, which you're about to get back into, right? Well, people keep trying to get me <laughs> to go back into music. Well, give us a brief, I wouldn't say <laughs> synopsis, but give us like a glimpse of some of the things that you've accomplished as a singer and where you came from, you know, like your training, stuff like that. Well, I was So people would think, hmm, yeah, that's similar to me. Maybe I can, you know, get into it or at least possibly follow somewhat in her footsteps, you know? Well, I did study opera. That was my major in college. And did you know UC Burling? No, I did not. Famous tenor? No. Well, he was way before your time. Okay. Beverly Sills, of yes, course. Yeah. Yes, yes. Who was your favorite? Um, Soprano. Uh, I just I don't know. I, I, there's so many of them. I it's been so long since I've been in the opera it's realm. So hard yeah. To sing opera. I could never do that. But my you know, I just sang opera because that's what I had to do. I, I actually went to college and I remember interviewing with them and they're like, "What do you want to do?" And I said, "I want to sing like Pat Benatar," and, because I was she was my mentor growing up. <laughs> and of course, they looked at me and they started laughing and they're like, You're, "There's not going to be any Pat Benatar here." So, <laughs> I, Mariah did uh, opera. She yes, was trained Mariah as opera. Yes, Mariah Carey. Oh, her voice. But jazz is more my forte. Uh -huh. Some of my mentors are, of course, um, Diane Schur. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, she's you know, the school, blind right? jazz singer, and she has this amazing range. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also, I also like a lot of, um, you know, Chaka Khan is one of my mentors mm -hmm. as well. So I, I toured around the United States, you know, singing in a band, dancing, performing in a band right out of college. Mm. I've done various backup singing gigs for other independent artists. Mm -hmm. I've had my own bands, you know, and own original music. Mm -hmm. But, um, Would you like to give us a acapella <laughs> burst oh, right on. now? <laughs> um, okay, let oh, me. Oh, mio bambino. Oh no, I can't. It's been many years since I've sung that. <laughs> uh, let, I can try to do it. By the way, she's French, Italian, right? French, the German. Mexican, German, and French. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me try to do a little bit of Diane Schur. Um, so. I just found out about love, and I like it. I like it. I like what love has been doing to me. I hold you close in my arms and I like it. I like it. Oh, what a wonderful future I see. There you go. Cool. Thank you. Very nice. Is there like, here I am trying to be a psychiatrist, is there a reason why that particular <laughs> song, when we're talking about love and these songs and past hurts and feelings that have intertwined, have locked you, snared you into the song? <laughs> I just like the song. <laughs> <laughs> then you're free. You're cured. <laughs> no, but that is Thank very nice. Thank you. Thank nice. you very much. So now let's break over to Miss Laureen Landon. She's a, she's <laughs> a veteran of... How many hundreds of movies? Two hundred. Two hundred movies. Wow. Yeah, you're you're the original <laughs> blonde, Amazon blonde. I'm the original you're, glow girl. You're a blom wow. show, a, a blonde oh. and a bomb show, a blom, blom show. show. <laughs> no, actually, I'm the original. Believe it or not, uh, glow girl. Uh, there's a very famous series on Netflix right now, and a long time ago, I did a movie, for uh, not a long time ago, you know, for Matt Simber, mm -hmm. who created Glow. Years ago, the action, and, right? Eh? Action. No, it was the lady wrestlers. Yeah, he had action. Seen me, yeah, he'd seen me in all the marbles. We are, we had known each other for years, but he had seen me in all the marbles, right? Mm -hmm. And I started with Peter Falk, MGM film, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, they saw two thousand girls, and they narrowed it down to two: Vicky Frederick and myself. Mm -hmm. Peter was one of my favorites. Did he, you break your ankle? Yes. How did you know that? 
Well, that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yeah, I, I read did. that you broke your ankle. I did, the last day of shooting. Mm. We wow. shot all the Were first. you afraid after you broke Never. your ankle that you weren't going to get no, it? No, they didn't know I broke my ankle. They said, How did they not great. know? It looks great. They thought it was real. Oh my God, it's so believable. And I, and, <laughs> you know, I broke my ankle and I was thrown out of the ring and I <sighs> climbed back in the ring and the DP's f uh, f following me and I'm hopping and screaming and he says, God, it's so believable. It's great, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> and so I can't oh, put it up right. But anyway, wow. anyway, Matt came to me after um, That's great, he saw Hundra, <laughs> uh, where I play a female Conan. I yeah, 38, yeah, yeah. 38 stunts in the film. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see it? I think I have. I play a uh, female Conan in the film, and we shot it in Almeria and Segovia. And, then, and for those in Okay. Forgot about Conan. That was Arnold Schwarzenegger was the male Conan. Right. Well, Roger Ebert said, I make. Arnold Schwarzenegger look like a sissy. <laughs> I did. Roger Ebert. <laughs> I swear he did. I have the proof. Of oh, Cisco and Ebert. Yeah. yeah. When he was alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously. And so anyway. Um, but you got like he came five, six films coming out this year? Yes. Just five. an amazing number Twelve. of. What? No, five. What are you talking about, Willis? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, the first game coming out is called um, Nation's Fire mm -hmm. that Thomas Churchill directed. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely adore this man because uh, he could have uh, chosen so many other different actresses for this role. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I play Bruce Dern's much younger wife, who's a lunatic, alcoholic, irreverent, psychotic. Uh, <laughs> basket case, trailer trash, and, you know, it was a real stretch for me. <laughs> we don't have to go there. <laughs> no acting required. <laughs> so, we won't tell them what we were talking yes. about beforehand. Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, so Thomas Churchill wrote this fabulous part for me named Myra, and I play the uh, mother of Krista Grotta, who is breathtaking, and she stars in the movie, and so does um, uh, Gil Bellows and... Oh, oh my gosh, there's so many stories in the film, but I have, I play, um, I play the mother of the lead actress in the film, mm. and it's, it's a great part, and I did some ADR work a few weeks ago, mm. and I saw AVI, AVI. ADR. What do you like about the parts? So oh, much? ADR. ADR, you know, the looping. Looping, yeah. With Bruce Dern. I saw my Voice over, kind of. Voice over, I saw my stuff with Bruce Dern, and, you know, um, much of my work was uh, extemporaneous because Thomas Churchill said, here's what you and Bruce are going to do. You do it. Go do it. And he trusted me that much. <clears throat> and for a director to trust an actress mm -hmm. that much without a script, some of the scenes, he said, just here's, what, here's my idea and go for it. And nothing rehearsed. I went to like, huh? screaming, crying out of my mind, mm -hmm. um, which I was supposed to do. And I'm getting accolades from the major studio that's going to release mm, it. That's great. Yeah, but I Quick cannot, question. I cannot thank Thomas Churchill enough. Quick question. When you said you were screaming, crying, I've done some acting, but I'm not like Oscar, but I know that when people have to do those really like gut wrenching scenes, they have to go somewhere, reach some, mm -hmm. some file I in their in experience. My love life. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I my love life. No. And that broke you down. No, I, 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 go, I go places um, uh, that are very, very personal. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes. So you can turn it on and off? It's my father. Yeah. Uh, uh, my father, who inspired me to get into show business because he loved all the old movies James Cagney, Marlon Brando. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> White heat. <coughs> can you punch my back? <laughs> Lower. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. I'll drive <laughs> So my father inspired me and I was very close to my dad, my father and I'm not gonna go into what happened to him uh, up in Vancouver, right? But uh, he but basically suffered a cardiac arrest and was dead thirteen minutes and then he got bladder wow. cancer. Sorry about and that. I took care of him for a long, long time. That's why I got out of the business. People say, Why is he getting out of the business? And I said, one, I couldn't stand the harassment, the sexual harassment, mm -hmm. which we better not go into. Mm -hmm. And also, I couldn't, I couldn't handle. Um, not Although we could, if you wanted to. No, I'm not going to go there because I don't want to. I, I, I'm not going to go there another time. Mm -hmm. um, we'll write a book about it. Um, timely. Funny you should say that. But anyway. So you um, are writing a book about it? 
I'm not going to say anything. Um, <laughs> anyway, oh bottom line God. is, oh bottom God. line is, I, I um, <laughs> go places in uh, my father, and I go other places, you know, that are very uh, personal, mm -hmm. and places I don't go normally because they hurt too much, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, you might have a meltdown. Mm -hmm. um, but I just did a film uh, to segue into Agramon's Gate that I, I star in with uh, uh, Alan Birch, who's gorgeous and an incredibly talented actor. He starred in um, uh, People Under the Stairs for Wes Craven. Mm -hmm. And uh, Katie Walleen stars in the, in the film. She's absolutely beautiful. It's directed by Harley Walleen. Is it scary? Yes, it's a horror suspense thriller, psychological thriller, along the lines of Alfred Hitchcock. Mm. This is what I love about psychological. This is what I love about Harley Walleen. He does psychological thrillers, and I mean, he reminds me. I tell him all the time. He reminds me so much of Robert Ald Robert Aldrich, mm -hmm. you know, who directed me in all the Marvels, mm -hmm. and he did the Dirty Dozen, Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, The mm. Longest Yard, mm. Hustle, hundreds of the greatest Black movies. Busters. The biggest movies of all time. He's considered, mm -hmm. Robert Aldrich was considered one of the ten greatest actors in the history of cinema. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to star in a film up for him uh, at MGM when I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. So now I'm 23. So, uh, <laughs> stop it. So I have a call. <laughs> You're going to edit this, right? We all are. Yeah. 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 Anyway, you know, got to stay young, got to stay young, right? Young at heart. And anyway, um, Harley Walleen is, is the epitome, epitome of um, um, cutting edge directors and he's won all kinds of awards for his movies that he already has out. He is just gracious and he knows what he wants. He wants, he's very specific what he wants and there's no goofing around with this gentleman and you know, you have to respect him for that because he's a pro. Mm -hmm. You know, I've worked with a lot of directors in my life and this man and Thomas Churchill are pros, you know, and there's no wiggle room really. And what mm -hmm. I also love about the, both these directors are that in the big blockbuster uh, studio films that I worked in, all the Marvels, I, the Jury, Airplane 2, uh, um, <clears throat> there's a window, eh? You have to stay within the window. Just say the lines, just say the lines, right? But in independent films, uh, I improv. I do a lot of improv, mm -hmm. yeah, I always improv, mm -hmm. improvise. So uh, the Hollywood Reporter gave me a phenomenal review for Sky, which is on Netflix right now. Um, and so it is uh, opposite Diane Kruger and Norman Reedus. Oh, wow. and, al and also- um, Can you tell us a little bit about uh, what Sky is about? It's about a girl on a journey with her husband and um, they're breaking up, basically. They're breaking up, it's the, they, they um, you know, they're French and they decide to take a trip across the desert and things go horribly wrong. You know, and she ends up killing him. Oh. And what part are you playing in it? Uh, I play a girl, uh, Charlene, that she meets in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. and they hook up. And I'm a bunny girl. I'm, I'm in this really sexy bunny outfit, and I have two Elvis impersonators on either <laughs> side of me, right? And with, you know, uh, my my character Charlene is a lost soul on remote control, basically, mm -hmm. and she's lost. You know, she she's too old to be a prostitute. She's too old to have a sugar daddy. She's too old to make a decent living. Um, so she's got these, and she's not too bright, right? Mm -hmm. Shut up. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you guys are thinking. No, no not even. even. Fool. <laughs> but anyway, so. Uh, no blonde jokes. Being facetious, of course, I think. Anyway, so we become best friends, and then we become lovers, and my part was huge. But Diane, uh, uh, you know, they had to cut it down because they shot 100 hours of footage. They, over 100 hours, uh, Fabian Bartrot shot over 112 hours, actually. But I had a great part in it, and uh, my character is tragic, but very funny. I improvise everything in it. <laughs> and what I love about working with independent directors is that they let you improvise, right? Mm -hmm. um, they let you in improvise and do what you want to do and I always come to the table with all kinds of uh, ideas you know I never come and say my lines because I think when you just say your lines in a scene mm -hmm. it's boring as hell you know mm -hmm. I come as a character I come you know 20 30 different options and that's you can ask Thomas and you can ask Mr. Harley Walleen and you can ask uh, my other director of uh, Terror Tales that I have coming out soon 
uh, Jimmy Lee Combs, who's a magnificent young director. He picked me up at the airport uh, in Colorado, and I thought he was 12. I didn't know who he was. I just thought, somebody's picking me up, and um, we're going to get pulled over. You know, I'm going to get arrested. <laughs> Obviously, I'm going to get arrested for being like his great granny or something. And some boy's driving me. He's like, hi, hi. And I said, I didn't know who he was. He said, I'm Jimmy. And I said, and I didn't put it together. So I, I got in the car, and I, I just looked at him, and I had my dog in, in the car with me. And the dog's a the very pimple. instrumental part of the film. I said, it, it's a dog. Its is name is pimple? Measles. Okay? <laughs> but it's insane what I did. I got in a lot of trouble. But anyway, he, he's driving. And I said, you know, so, so where are we going? Where's the, dire with the director? And he says, I am the director. And I said, <laughs> what? <laughs> I, looked, I thought he was swear. I thought he was seven, 12, 15, 17 years old. And he was incredibly adept, uh, knew exactly what he was doing, mm -hmm. and it, it was like he'd been doing this all his life. And he, he, it's an anthology. Terror Tales is an anthology, or an mm -hmm. omnibus, if you will. And it's about uh, a husband who is being held captive by this serial killer mm. who plays my son. Oh, and I was going to say, my son in real life, you. the serial killer. My stalker, actually. <laughs> I, have a, I have a stalker. Which Although movie is this? People should marry stalkers, you know what?